the halibut was so light. It was almost 20 pound halibut. I mean, it was definitely a 20 pound halibut because when I weighed what was left of it, it weighed 19 pounds. <laughs> and the bite taken out of it. No, it was shredded because <laughs> the thing didn't take really any bite. It folded it over and just, just plowed down on it. So it shredded the meat off of them, literally like you had laid the halibut down and run a lawnmower over it. This is the Teeth Podcast. Wild animal attack stories, firsthand from the survivors. I am Jeremy Carberry, a wilderness kayak guide, animal handler, the survivor of a few attacks myself, and your host. A prehistoric shark that spends most of its time in cold, deep, and dark canyons a thousand feet under the surface of the ocean has ascended into shallower waters off the coast of Los Angeles to hunt for prey. It's early 2009, and while spearfishing halibut, Paul Romanowski becomes one of the only people ever to find himself inside the jaws of a massive, broad-nosed, seven-gill shark. It only takes about a minute of being inside his home in Orange County to realize this guy has probably spent as much or more of his life on and in the ocean as he has on dry land. There are multiple spearfishing competition trophies in the living room. There is a very large spiny lobster mounted above the fireplace. And above the kitchen table is a beautiful Japanese Gyutaku style art that is done by covering a freshly caught fish in ink and then capturing the image of the fish by pressing it on rice paper. We cracked open two Pacificos and Paul began telling me about how he first got into spearfishing. On a primitive level, I was like probably walking age, four or five years old. And my uncle, I grew up in Hawaii, mind you, I'm born in Hawaii, I oh, okay. grew up there. And my uncle literally used to do the old school thing where they take the torch out and drag an ice chest behind them on the reef and walk on top of the reefs at night and stab fish. He actually caught also a lot of small octopus doing that. Yeah. And so he had a couple of different spears that he would actually carry different heads with him and he'd just screw them onto his spear real quick. And then what they did was towed an ice chest behind him. And there's a great trade-off. You got ice in the ice chest and some water, some salt water, and a bunch of beer. And as you go and drink the beer, then once the beer was empty, the ice chest was full of fish, and the night was over, and you go home. But yeah, so I actually caught eels was one of the big things, is you take little pieces of shrimp and coconut oil. And so you chew coconut oil or kukui nuts, which they'll give you the run. So I didn't chew the kukui nuts. I chew coconuts. And uh, you spit the, spit the oil on the surface of the water and it'll glass it off so you can see without a mask. Because you're only oh, working wow. in six inches to a foot of water and you yeah. reach into a hole. So you put these pieces of shrimp inside of your hand and you reach in the hole and these little eels will come up between your fingers to grab it. And you just literally quickly scoop them up and throw them in the ice chest Whoa. and keep moving. That sounds like a pretty awesome childhood. It was like, you know, Gilligan's Island. I lived it. <laughs> it's kind of a neat time. When Paul was a bit older, he and his family moved to Southern California, where his love of the ocean continued. As a young man, he worked on commercial fishing boats. Before we get into the story, I'd like to note that overfishing sharks is a serious problem that is having a devastating negative effect on the health of the oceans. The key word is overfishing. I personally haven't done enough research to really defend any commercial shark fishing, but I do know that what happens on commercial fishing boats in California is very closely regulated, and the species of sharks mentioned on this episode have all been sustainably caught while following all local laws. When I worked on sport fishing boats uh, in another era, right, you're going way back in time, like 1986, 1987, when I'm a teenager, and I was working on the California Dawn when we had brought the boat down from Westport, Washington and fishing it out of Davies Locker. And we did shark trips. And so we'd catch, you know, we took customers out. We'd take a max of 15 people on the boat. 
you set up a drift and you start catching sharks. We caught lots of blue sharks and we caught a couple of threshers here and there, but we didn't fish threshers the right way, so we this didn't is catch all a lot. Real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we catch them. Uh, we caught a couple threshers, but we didn't fish them the right way. We didn't troll them. We didn't drag live baits much. We were just throwing chunks of meat over the side and waiting for sharks to come up. But we did catch quite a few makos and we got some bruisers. We got some big ones. And I've had several mako sharks push me off the boat. <laughs> like I, we. Off, off the boat into the water. I was safer to go in the ocean than be on a boat with that fish. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, one of the first real big ones we brought up, we gaffed one. And the boss said, put a gaff in it in the bow, and we'll drag it down to the back of the boat. This is about a 200, 250-pound mako. So it's a big fish. And I'm a real fat guy back then, probably about 125 pounds, six feet tall. <laughs> Beanpole, right? I'm a stick. <laughs> And so, I, yeah, I'm full of, full of piss and vinegar, and I reach over and I pop this thing with the gaff, and the boss is getting ready to shoot it. And the shark, as soon as I hit it with the gaff, the shark comes out of the water because Makos will jump. And I hit it. We thought it was fairly tired, and you'd be wrong. And it come up, and, and I pulled back instinctively on the gaff. I just pulled back on the gaff and dragged that thing into the bow of that boat with me. And oh, it's an wow. open bow rail boat. It wasn't like an enclosed bow, like on the if you go on the freelance or the first string or some of the other big boats. It's an enclosed bow with a with a wooden plank rail. This is an open deck with a metal bow rail around it. And so that shark promptly broke the gaff right and sm and smacked the heck out of me with it. And then it was me and that thing in the bow of the boat, and it. Sp basically spun around and it starts smashing the railing and i mean bending the rail with its tail just smashing into everything and it wound up with the business end of the shark pointed towards me and i was in the water that was that i didn't you, i didn't need any more prompting i was just back i just did a half backflip straight over the rail or something and i was gone i was like yep not staying here Paul dabbled with spearfishing smaller species in shallow water like Corbina, but when he discovered people were shooting bigger fish and faster fish than he had ever thought possible, like wahoo and yellowtail, he got into it, really into it. Joining the Los Angeles-based spearfishing group, the Fathomers, plugged him into a community. Over the years and even decades, Paul has gained a lot of experience and success diving primarily off of California and Mexico. Paul has also traveled to places like the Carolinas and Texas to pursue his passion. Through the years, he has had quite a few encounters with large sharks, including the most temperamental and territorial of them all, the bull shark. Dealt with bulls in Texas, and I've dealt with bulls and, and all the others in, um, in Hatteras. And that was really hard because those were, there's lots of the smaller white tips, silkies and duskies and stuff, and swarming. Lots of swarming. And so a lot of opportunities to get bit on accident. Yeah. And you shoot like king mackerel there and amberjack and stuff. And so the king mackerel are just oily and stinky and bloody. And, and they draw them like nothing you've ever seen. I never seen any fish draw sharks as fast as that. That was an eye opener that I was pretty far from the boat in heavy current. And I shot that fish. And when I tried to put the brakes on it to stop it early, because I had a hunkering at all those sharks around me, I never seen any fish turn them on like that. Those were really wow. bad. That was really bad. Like Wahoo in Texas, it was pretty bad, you know. And, um, and in Texas, it was a lot of bulls. The bulls ride underneath the other ones. And the problem is when they show up, everybody else moves out of the way. Yeah. They don't even think twice about it. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, we, we deal with one to two to five or six bulls and, you know, one or two and you put other divers in the water to try and protect you and get your fish back if you can. And you start to see three, four, five, you're done with that area. You just pack up and leave and run. There's nothing else to do to get in the boat and bail. Yeah. Just not ideal. Problem is, is that like when you are fighting your fish, your competition to them. And it's very easy to them to go and clip it. I mean, I watch bulls rip apart other sharks, rip them apart. 
going, which where sharks were going after my wahoo, and I watched them just rush up and just tear apart a five foot silky just because he was annoying them. And after that silky got shredded, every other silky skipped. They were like, well, that's that. They were gone. I mean, they were like, and it was like, great. So it's me and this guy, and this guy's a shark eater. And it's like, wow, that's cool. I'm leaving, you know? And what are you going to do? And, you know, and, and your backup divers are like, you know, that polite little tap on the shoulder. We're out of here. Goodbye. Good luck. You just, you're at a bar and you just picked a fight with Leroy Brown, dude. You're on your own. Goodbye. There's a song about this. Good luck. They're really, really serious. You know, they're very, very serious. Sir. Uh, you can't deter them. There's, no, there's not much to them. I mean, one of our trips we went on. I went with, uh, we had a diver back out for, you know, sinus issue medical. He wasn't feeling it. He was sick. And so he didn't go with us. So I wound up being the only guy diving on a trip where we went out to go fish Wahoo and red snapper and stuff. And so, yeah, we got, we trolled a couple Wahoo and the other guys were all happy and they're like, okay, jump in and shoot your fish. And, and I was solo and it was like the, it was the most thing you ever did in your life because you know they keep throwing guns overboard at me with new power heads on and I'm just plugging like knocking big sharks off of me and off of my fish while I'm trying to deal with my fish and bungee it and short line it back and you know and you're just watching big bulls sink out after they've been power headed because they're going after you and then you see another big sharks pick them up and swim away and you're like I don't want to be here anymore at all. So it took it took four Wahoo to get one in the boat. Wow. I had the fourth one and it was it was not even you know, it was just a they were all average size fish. It wasn't anything like special one way or the other, but to get to that one fish, you know, and I was laughing, I was like, How many power heads do you guys have? And they were laughing, they're going, They're reloadable, don't worry about it. The endless supply. I was like, My God. That's normal for that. They're used yeah, to yeah. Bulls. Which yeah. at times they have to. At this point in our interview, I needed to take a break to go to the bathroom. When I came back, Paul had just pulled out a Tupperware from the refrigerator. Ooh, what you got there? He proceeded to slam down a chunk of Wahoo. Nice. Oh. Oh, nice. Thank you so much. Wahoo and Opa, which he had smoked himself. He just gave me a slab of each, no fork or utensil. And then he took two slabs for himself and just started eating them with his bare hands. So, of course, I followed suit. This fish is great. What's the more tender one? Um, hold it up. Let me see. Like that's bad. opa yeah there's something else yeah for people who haven't had it the best way to describe it is uh the best qualities and properties of salmon and the best qualities and properties of tuna yeah. put together yeah that's, so that's pretty accurate the location of the 2009 seven gill attack was Palos Verdes in Los Angeles, located between Long Beach and LAX, also known as PV. We used to dive the kelp beds and we never really saw seven gills. We heard of them and we'd see one every once in a blue moon. I mean, when I say like, like 50, 60 active divers in the Fathom Ears, diving, you know, PV all the time for sea bass and stuff. And one, maybe two would get seen in a whole season. And then the dynamic changes as the ocean does. And all of a sudden we started to see lots of seven gills and they got bigger and they got bigger. It's somewhere between seven and 10 feet long and between say 175 and maybe 300 pounds, pretty big. And, um, and they look like an oaf. They look like a dopey, lopey, they're a bottom shark. They don't have like fancy cut hard edge shapes to them. They don't look like there's something that would be rocket ship fast. Yeah, they're pretty prehistoric mud dweller kind of bottom sharks. Every once in a while somebody shoot a sea bass and it wrap up real deep and you go down and there'd be one kind of milling around. But we weren't having to fight them for our fish. 
The broad-nosed seven-gill shark get their name from the shape of their snout and the extra two gills that they have compared to most other sharks, which have five. They also do not have a distinctive dorsal fin that most other shark species have on their backs. Instead, the seven gill has a very small dorsal fin just before the tail. Broad-nosed seven gills have been seen swimming off of every continent except Europe. Its teeth are also unique. You're probably familiar with white shark's jaws and teeth. Its teeth generally go straight down from the top jaw and from the bottom jaw, they go straight up. A seven gill shark's teeth are crooked and angled toward the outside corners of the mouth, which makes it hard to believe that they aren't from England. The reason for this is when it shakes its head from left to right, the angled teeth can more effectively tear through whatever flesh it is latched onto. They are a really bizarre creature that looks like it crawled out of a prehistoric biology textbook. Accounts of seven gills attacking humans are very rare, which makes this story all the more interesting. And so there's a pretty good halibut season going on, and we've been knocking them out. And then a buddy of mine called me up, and he laughs, and he says, you know, I got two in the dirty water, and I spooked three fish over 20. And I was like, when was this? And he's like, last night, like four hours ago. And he's like, I got out of the water at two in the morning. I stayed until I turned purple. But I'm just letting you know, because like the morning high tide is in, the viz will be there, and it's all yours. And I got to go to work. So have at it. On the morning of the attack in early 2009, the water temperature was around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and the visibility was only six feet. If you are tall, that means you can't even see the tip of your own fins clearly. Imagine walking through a forest where the fog is so intense you can only see slightly further than you can reach. I'm pretty comfortable in the ocean, but these kind of conditions freak me out even when sharks are not around. Paul, on the other hand... No, it's... Me. I mean, for, for halibut diving, it's really comfortable. It was enough viz, you know, in shallow water that you can see them. You can just get above the bottom and you drop in... Uh, you're not sinking. It's shallow diving. It's very nice. Okay. A little bit cold, but but they're there, and you just and you know there's a good amount of current goofing you around because you're almost in the like you said almost in the surf line. There's a little bit of surge, and so it's easy. It uncovers them. It covers them up. It's a good game to play. You know, it makes for good diving. It makes good for skill building. You can do, relatively speaking, long dives, and uh, you know, if you're training or something, you know, you can do these, you can do really long swimming dives and, mm -hmm. and you're not in a lot of, in general risk, you know, you just, when you go to get air, you just pretty much stick your head up and you're, you're on the surface in one second flat. So it's comfortable in that respect and it's a good way to train and, and it's very, it's, it's like lo lobster diving, a lot of lobster diving in shallower water is very cardiovascular. You can actually get a workout doing it. Well, I like it, you know, it's fun diving. So... We, I rolled down in there, and my dive partner at the time, she, uh, I was diving with Kelsey a lot. That's Kelsey Albert, the Kelsey Albert, who is a multiple world record holder for trophy fish she has speared all around the world. And she's got an absolute, you know, thing for hunting halibut. It's it's a huge part of her diving. And so we got in and we started looking and we we're having a great time and we started smacking halibut and we were getting some pretty good fish. We had seen a lot of sharks and so the leopard sharks were in there breeding. So there was leopards up to six feet long and like five foot of viz and they were bumping into you, but they're not a threat. I don't yeah. really ever feel threatened in any way by them. They don't even have teeth, right? They got Molar. teeth. They just have those molars, right? Let one bite you and call me back. <laughs> they got teeth. They will they they're fish eaters. Okay. They no, they don't have molars. They've got smaller teeth, but their their teeth are maybe uh three sixteenths, eighth of an inch long. Oh, okay. And but they will saw you and if one grabs you and he starts rolling and twisting, he's taking material with oh, him. Wow. Oh yeah. And their jaws are plenty strong enough to do the job. Okay. But they, in general they, they want nothing to do with you. They don't want to fight at all. And these ones are breeding, so it doesn't matter. That's not what they're there for at all. These shark would let you come up and rub up against them. They'd rub up against you 
And to, it's it's unnerving because it's dirty water, but it's beautiful because they're gorgeous, big, big females in there. And they're five, six-foot leopard sharks, really, really big. And yeah, six-foot female leopards, like 60 pounds. I mean, it's not a heavy shark, you know, but uh, but gorgeous, right? And the viz just didn't do it any justice. If it sounds like Paul knows firsthand that leopard sharks have sharp teeth, it's because he does. I found this out later when I asked him if the seven gill was the first time a shark had actually clamped onto you. Other than dumb stuff. What's the dumb stuff? You know, like uh, somebody says, you know, we, we don't have any fish. We got a big party coming. They fish tacos. It sucked. We got like three calicos. So you go down and pop like a big five foot leopard shark on purpose and then when you bring it up all hot and green and everything and you hand it and somebody gets thing grabs onto you that's a different story that's dumb stuff don't really know too many people that would consider getting bit by a five foot leopard shark dumb stuff but paul's the kind of guy that that's not really a big deal to him so back to palos verdes on the morning of the attack Paul and his dive partner, Kelsey, are swimming in very crappy visibility of about five to six feet. One of the dives, you see this thing go by and it's like, whoa, that was big. That was big. And so I got a look at one of them, and I, you know, you, you do wonder, you know, it's it's like if that one got bad intentions, what is it? And, uh, and then I got a glimpse of it, and then I told Kelsey, I said, there's a bigger shark, a much bigger shark in here. And, and uh, she goes, yeah? She goes, I've just seen like two of them. And she goes, one of them's absolutely huge. So that means there's multiples in there. So they're not in there breeding, they're in there feeding. They are in there and they can locate halibut and other fish off the bottom. That's what they do. So we're diving around and I shot another halibut and it went pretty berserk. I think that was like the fourth one out of a five fish limit. I was laughing, I'm going, I'm gonna limit. And my five fish limit's gonna be pushing like 80 pounds. This is gonna be a good day. I had a bunch of big halibut on me and I was like, this is really turning into a mess. And while I was dealing with this fish, this shark came through and smacked into my legs and literally like, basically bowled me over and then it turned around and it came back and it definitely went towards my halibut the seven gill that came after you was pushing plus seven. that fish there was like seven feet and probably let's say 14 16 inches in diameter fairly heavy fish it bumped you you felt it well yeah 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 i mean well it can and, and it made itself real visible because i was dealing with the halibut and it came right between my feet like up from underneath me, and I'm only in 10 feet of water, wow. in shallow, shallow water. As far as we're sitting apart was as far as you could see, and the shark was half the distance, and it was all over my fish. And so I, so I pull my fish away, and I literally kick it a couple of times, you know, put my feet up in its face. And it left me alone. So the fish, you know, was roughhousing with me, and that wasn't so great. And then Kelsey had said she was having them on her, and so I killed this halibut finally. I put it on me and I load the gun. You know, four out of five ain't bad, right? I'm gonna pass on a limit, I'm gonna get out of here. And I turned around and I said, you know, I think it's probably time we cut our losses. The dive partner wanted to get her limit of five fish before getting out of the water. The two of them reach a compromise when Kelsey tells Paul, Okay, I'm gonna do a couple more dives and find a fish and I'll just get another one to match you and then we're gone. This might sound crazy to somebody who doesn't fish or hunt, but what you have to realize is you don't get conditions every day that produce fish like this. Whenever they are in close water and you know where they are and you're getting them, it's very exciting and, and you want to get your limit because you don't know when the next time you're going to get these kind of conditions. It might not be for months or maybe even a year. Soon after they reached the compromise of Kelsey getting one more fish and calling it a day. She pops up and I see her 
and she's obviously tangling with a fish. And so I turn, and I start to swim towards her. And suddenly I was moving sideways in the water in a, the only way I can describe it is like hydraulic. It's like, imagine like uh, trying to push against a car while it's just driving against you. <laughs> and I was going sideways. And, and I realized that that was like way not normal. I looked down and there is the head of a humongous seven gill on my right thigh and the entire big halibut, the big, you know, there's several halibut on, on my stringer and this giant halibut is wrapped around my leg, completely folded around it like a taco shell. And this thing bears down on it and he crushes down into it and he starts shaking so fast. I mean, pushed and there's nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing. I mean, I'm stuck in this thing's mouth. It ain't letting go. And I can feel like the pressure of it, but I'm not feeling the teeth just yet. I did the first thing which comes to mind, which is start pounding on that thing. You might as well be hitting a rock because that's what a shark's head feels like when you're punching it as freaking hard as you can underwater. And the thing is, I was breathing. I was very lucky. I'm on the surface. So what didn't happen down 50 feet. It's gonna happen while I was on the surface swimming. And so at least I could, you know, I got, I, I had a good breathe up or whatever. And I wasn't, I didn't feel that, that kind of a compromise. And um, in the end, I just started like, when I realized I could see its eye and then I recognized sticking my face into the water to look at the shark that was on me. I'm recognizing that it was a really, really big seven gill. I started punching it right in the eye and trying to push and the push thing didn't work too much. Even the halibut was real slimy, so it actually did have a little bit of effect, but I, I think I instinctively probably curled my leg up or something, which kind of helped lock the thing in place. When it clamped down on your leg, uh, you felt the pressure of him biting the halibut, him biting through the halibut, and then your leg was like in the middle of that. Imagine like putting your leg in a vise and just start tightening it. It was that much kind of pressure. It was like the amount of pressure the thing drove in. And what was weird is, you know, okay, you got a wetsuit on and then you got this fish wrapped around it that's a couple inches thick and you couldn't feel the shark's teeth, just this immense amount of pressure. And then when the thing started sawing back and forth, you could actually feel the sawing action, which wasn't reaching to your leg just oh, yet. God. So that part was interesting because he did shake his head like that. Uh, you know, your brain fast forwards all those things. So it feels like it takes forever, but. Yeah. I would say grand total, he was on that fish for about four or five seconds. Grand total. Yeah. Um, because like I hit him and it didn't phase him and he quit pushing me. At the end, he quit pushing me. He was driving me when he hit, when he hit it. Now, right at the end, just a few seconds, and then he stopped, and he couldn't figure out, I don't know, what the hell else to do or something, and I was hitting it, and it just let go. It wasn't like I beat the thing and it let go. I didn't phase it. I didn't phase that fish at all. <laughs> and um, But that one, was a, that one was the really big one that we had both seen, and that shark was, I'd say that fish is probably 18 inches thick or something, maybe like, yeah, 18 to 20 inches thick or something. And the smaller ones we see in general are 10 inches thick. This thing was double the girth. And um, the jaw the jaw with the bite, you know, on my leg, you're, as you're looking down on that thing, probably is like, looked like it was about nine inches, 10 inches wide, solid. And um, so thankfully the halibut was so wide, it was an almost 20 pound halibut. I mean, it was definitely a 20 pound halibut because when I weighed what was left of it, it weighed 19 pounds. <laughs> and the bite taken out of it. No, it was shredded because <laughs> the thing didn't take really any bite. It folded it over and just, just plowed down on it. So it shredded the meat off of them, literally like you had laid the halibut down and run a lawnmower over it. Wow. 
on the top and bottom. So there's a section right in the middle that was okay, and then the section towards the tail and a section by the head that were both destroyed, completely destroyed. And it went straight through all of that and broke the spine at the head and not at the tail, but at the head, it broke the spine, went right through. And so that was what left a couple of scratches in my leg and a, a pretty good series of little holes in my wetsuit, but it didn't cut through the wetsuit. It left holes through the wetsuit. And so I, I wound up with like, uh, you know, like little pencil mark scratches on my leg on the inside of my thigh a little or on the top of my thigh I should say towards the inside where he just bared down and he started shaking that was that one time when it when it made it through Kelsey's like I'm having trouble with my fish I was like yes yeah, so am I yeah I just got hit by one of these things so let's get out of here she's like you got hit I'm like oh yeah you know I really got hit and we need to go we swam straight into the breakers there and just like, you know, okay, I'm going to take a beating on the rocks. I don't care. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Straight in, past the rocks and, uh, you know, get rolled over by six or seven waves and not even care and just motor and don't even stop until you're standing on dry land. Yeah, yeah I want it out pretty good. So we swam in, and there's some kid down there, and somebody else had told him that there was halibut in, and he's like, I'm going out to get him. And I said, you just watch out for the, for the sharks. And he laughs. He goes, ha, ha, scare somebody off the spot. And I said, no, there's seven gills in there. I guess there's a lot of leopard sharks, but there's seven gills in there, and they're very aggressive, really aggressive. And I said, you need to watch that. So we didn't even make it quarter way up the hill, and this kid's screaming, there's a great white after me. <laughs> What? There's a way out there too. No, no, it was a seven, seven gill. Believe me, gill. believe me. If you've never seen like a good sized shark, like I looked yeah. down, I didn't know what shark it was for a good hard second, and yeah. the only thing that goes through your mind is that fishzilla has come to eat you. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that thing came right on him. I mean, wow. right on him. Wow. Decentralized blockchain technology is creating a welcome alternative to our central bank systems. But crypto can be complicated and overwhelming. I know this because I've tried a lot of different exchanges and have paid a lot of not so upfront fees in the process. I've found that OKCoin is the easiest and most affordable on-ramp to decentralized ecosystems like Terra Luna, Avalanche, Ethereum, and many others. There are no fees to send and receive funds from your bank, and the fees to swap between assets are the lowest around. If you create and transfer $100 of funds to an OKCoin account using the link in this episode's show notes, after 30 days, the Teeth Podcast gets $10 of Bitcoin, and so do you. But please do your own research because this is not financial advice. As a really new podcast, this helps us out to bring you more episodes like the one you are listening to right now. Speaking of which, back to the show. I told my buddy who turned me on to the spot, and he says, all right, we'll go finish that one off. And so like two days later, they dove that zone. That fish came in, and they killed it. Wow. They got they got done with it. They just yeah they just bent a bunch of gear up and killed it and stopped it. So and that fish was very very big. It was damn near you know the body's ten feet long. Wow! Did they get a picture of it? Uh, I don't know that they got pictures of it. They gave it to the neighbors. They like cut it up into like three or four to get it up the hill. They had to cut it in three or four pieces because you there was no way that two wow. guys were carrying it up. The massive shark that attacked Paul was almost certainly a female and was between 40 and 50 years old. The female seven gills, like many large sharks that live birth their young, grow bigger so that they can carry their multiple babies to term, which takes 12 months. Female seven gills grow to about seven feet, while a male typically grows to about five feet. While uncommon, other very large seven gills have been reported up to just under 10 feet long, or uh, exactly three meters. Right around the time that we did this interview, on December 19th, 2020, 
there was a 9.5 foot long seven gill estimated to weigh over 350 pounds caught off the Ocean Beach Pier in San Diego. It was photographed but not weighed on an official scale. If it was actually over 350 pounds, it would be the heaviest seven gill ever caught. I sent Paul a photo of what was probably the world record seven gill shark as a reference to get an idea of just how big his shark was. He said the one that got him was slightly thinner, but similar sized. Either way, the shark that attacked Paul in 2009 was likely one of the biggest seven gill sharks that anyone has ever been in the mouth of, and more impressively, escaped from. It's unfortunate that they killed Paul's big seven gilled friend, but given the circumstances, the options were pretty limited. They're not easy to deal with because they become accustomed to divers. They become accustomed to taking your fish. They are fish eaters and they're scavengers of sorts, but they're still hunters very much. And there's no easy way to, to convince them to leave you alone. There have been a couple that divers get to recognize them because of scars on them and such. And the, their, their mannerism, and you can't mistake it after a while. And you're not the only one to see it, but three, four, five of your friends see the same fish, the same problem. All that thing would have to do is get a hold of my leg without that fish there, and I'd be hospital bound yeah. for sure. Wow. There's, no, there's not even disputing it. They got big teeth. Yeah. There's no saying that, oh, you, you sloughed that one off. There would be no sloughing that fish off. If that thing grabbed your arm. Number one, your whole hand would go down its throat like nothing, and it'd be chewing up your forearm at the very least. It could grab you basically anywhere it wanted to, and it would do some damage. It would do some real damage. And the bite strength was, I, you know, you'd, you'd think that you understand how hard something can bite, but it's like nobody gets, not too many people get bit by a dog where the dog bites you and just stays hung on to you mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And... Very much so. And then a dog's bite radius is small. And so this thing fit a lot of leg in its mouth, which was really surprising to me at the time. Paul acknowledges that a lot of factors worked together that morning to contribute to him being okay. He was at the surface and had oxygen in his lungs. The 20-pound halibut that functioned as a buffer between the shark's teeth and his leg and the thickness of his wetsuit. It was a true quarter mil, a six mil just tore up the nylon on the top of the suit was just shredded but going in there was only little puncture holes through the bottom of it so yeah so he just barely got into the suit and only on the top on the bottom there was two or three holes which would be the like the bottom of my thigh the wetsuit didn't really protect you very much it was more the the, the halibut it was a halibut being sacrificed and the thing is the halibut being able to slide along the wetsuit that's what saved my saved my leg from getting really wow. torn up had I been in a 3-2, I'd have been in much worse shape. The suit wouldn't have held up. Had that halibut been a 10-pounder oh. instead of a 20-pounder, he'd have gone right through that thing because it was wow. a thinner fish. And I got lucky in that respect that there was a whole bunch more fish for him to deal with. Probably messed up his bite and everything else. Up until that point, you said you hadn't really seen seven gills regularly. They were starting, that was when they, that we really started to see them. I mean, nowadays, they're very common, and there's, a, there's actually an expansion in their range in the areas where divers see them, where we never saw them before. The numbers are increasing. They're coming up out of the canyons more. It's just one of nature cycles, yeah. and we don't know when it'll fall off or whatever or how it'll change, but... No, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you know, 95, we weren't seeing them like that. One, two, three, a year. And now, if you're diving sea bass on the north face of PV or you're diving sea bass at Point Loma or La Jolla, you're going to see them. You're going to see them. After multiple encounters with multiple different sharks and multiple different oceans, I really wanted to know how... Paul thought of sharks, how he viewed them, what his relationship was to them, especially after being helplessly locked inside the jaws of one. They're cool. I mean, I don't mind, I don't mind being in the water with them. And, you know, even, I mean, even the, 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 the hard players, you know, tigers and bulls, 
Um, you know, I got a, obviously a real healthy respect for for them and for oceanic white tips because I've seen how they work and and once you're stalked by a couple of them and you you see it like a real big shark sizing up on you, it'll make you think twice about it. Want to get back in the water for the whole rest of the day or the rest of the trip, but in general, you realize that they van they vanish as quick as they show up, and for the most part, they they really don't want anything to do with you, and they're just doing their thing. And so I don't feel I don't feel bad about it, and I'm very at ease with most of them. You know, I I don't have a problem I mean, diving in Hawaii and shooting fish. Um, outside the moy pen and having three or four tigers around that are in the, you know, five to 10 foot range and, and not really having any kind of a problem with those and shooting some fish. And I know they, they get more numerous and they come in and they're curious, but they are not looking for you and, and they're really not even that interested in your fish. So it's okay. It's just you and them are going to interact because if you're driving on the highway and you don't like driving around big rigs, well, you're going to drive around big rigs. Doesn't matter. You just get used to it. I got more than I need. I really appreciate that. No sweat, brother. The Teeth Podcast is dedicated to Jim Giganti. Music is by Davy Chedwigan and Joshua Lopez. Our self described entertainment expert is Scott Neary. And I am Jeremy Carberry. The reason you're listening to this right now is because of all the friends and family members who have encouraged and contributed. You know who you are. Thank you so much. I hope you make time to get outside today, even if it's a short walk around your neighborhood to investigate the squirrels. Someone needs to keep them accountable. But as always, be sure to give the wildlife the space and respect it deserves. Thanks again for listening and supporting. Have a great day.